Well, good morning once again, everybody. We're, we're going to take a little break from uh, the, the book of Acts, and we'll get into some, uh, some Christmas sermons and, uh, for the next three weeks. So, uh, so this is Christmas. We, it's the most wonderful time of the year, right? So it's in that vein that I'm going to bring everybody down. Because, no, I, it, seriously though, I mean, it, it's always, because of God, it's always great news uh, in, the, in the whole, in the uh, absolute. But yet, when you think about why do we have Christmas? Why do we, why do we have Christmas? It's because of sin. That's why we have Christmas, because of sin. And God's not dispassionate about our salvation. He's not dispassionate about it. I mean, it's born out of his love and grace that we are saved, that Jesus had to come. He had to be born. He had to live the perfect life in our place, bear our sins in his body, and be raised in glory, and we will follow suit. Uh, but it's because of sin that, that this whole thing happened. And so um, it's important to reflect on that because, you know, we, you know the lights are great and, and the, the, the Christmas carols are great, uh, but Jesus had to go through everything he did because of sin. And because he loves us, he endured what he endured. It's an amazing thing. I, I, again, there's times that I can't wrap my head around it and maybe we're not supposed to in this life anyway. But I guess the next thing we have to ask then is where does the sin start? Where does the sin actually start? So your first thought might be Adam and Eve. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good, uh, a good start, but I think you need to go back even further. And it starts with Satan. It starts with his fall. It starts with the pride that was in him. Okay, that's it. That's it. I'm done. I'm not even going to give it even one scintilla of a chance. Bye-bye. Uh, but um, and some people, they'll, they'll end up saying, well, see, um, God created Satan. He created him perfect, and Satan fell, so God created evil. No. God only created the potential for evil. He created the potential for evil by creating anything. Because you have to keep in mind, God can't create another being like himself. It's, it's self-contradictory. Because God is self-existent and eternal, so just by the very act of creation, he cannot create another being like himself. All right, so, so Satan fell. The pride was found in him, and he made a choice, and he acted on that choice. And so, what's, what's so bizarre about it, I guess, is that he was sealed for eternity after he made that decision. After Satan made the decision to rebel against God, his fate was sealed eternally. The third of the angels that made that same decision to follow Satan, their fate was sealed eternally. There's no going back. Two-thirds of the angels that stay loyal to God, their fate was sealed eternally as well. They can't be lost. They can't go backward. So that test was there. That presentation was there. There was a choice to be made. Some chose the right path. Some chose the wrong path. So God didn't create evil, but he did create the potential for evil because he created beings that have volition, that have the ability to make decisions and then act on those decisions. And as Chuck Missler used to say, that's a frightening capability to have that power to be able to make these choices. And again, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just speculating here. I, I can't speak one way or the other with any theological certainty about this, but is it possible that, that, that Satan, if there was a time when he was those feelings were stirring up in him that he could have went to the Lord? I don't know. Maybe he could have went to the Father and said, hey, I'm having this problem. But the fact is, he made the decision that he did, and that's what started it. That's what started the 
cascade of sin that would pass down from Satan and then eventually uh, to Adam and Eve. So then we get to Adam and Eve. Now Adam and Eve are direct creations of God. The angels were direct creations of God, and yet Adam and Eve are of a different order of creation, right? Because they're human beings. They're of a different order of creation. So the test that was put before Adam and Eve, they failed, okay? Because they chose to believe the lie of Satan, who came in the form of the serpent. They chose to believe that lie. And that they could be like God, that they'd have his knowledge and so forth. So it was the same type of sin, the sin of pride, the sin of rebellion. But the difference is, is that Adam and Eve's fate wasn't eternally sealed because of their decision. They still had a chance to be saved, where the angels and, and, and Satan didn't. They didn't have that chance. Once they made that decision, it was all over. Um, that's why uh, Erwin Lutzer many years ago said something really interesting. He said that um, it's interesting that the, 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 that the serpent in the garden was, uh, that God chose that as the, um, or that it happened that way because a snake is one of the few animals that can't go backwards. You know, it can't crawl backwards. So each time it creeps along, I mean, that's it. It's going forward. So once Satan made that move, there was no going back, and so it's interesting that the serpent is uh, who corrupted mankind. But sin is something that brought in death and decay and rot and, um, and disease and everything. Now, Adam and Eve were direct creations of God, but we come from them. So we inherit their sin. There's just no way around that, folks. We inherit the sin that comes from Adam and Eve. And because once that sin enters in, everything goes haywire. And so as Adam and Eve have children and they have children and they have children and so forth, it just passes down. That's just endemic. That's just the way it is. And I wonder if... The more sin that's out there, the more sin that's committed, and the more it's upped, that the creation doesn't break down more and more. I'm just, it's just, just another thought uh, that I don't know if I can answer directly. But, um, but once again, what if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned? I, that's another question I have. So you guys, I'm, 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 I'm not telling you much today. I'm asking a bunch of questions that I want answers for. And so, you know, each one of you can get up and give uh, a sermon here because I don't know the answer to these questions. But um, I, based on the very fact that we are not God, that anything God creates is less perfect than him, is it inevitable that sin was going to happen? Is it just inevitable? What if Adam and Eve didn't sin? This, again, I don't know this theologically. What if they didn't sin? Did that mean that things would have been sealed there eternally? And there would have been no need for Jesus to die on the cross because, you know, everybody would have been passed down all the, the perfection. What if somebody, you know, five generations after Adam and Eve, if they're the ones that made the mistake? I mean, we don't know these things. Or is it just that because, again, it's inevitable that sin is going to happen because we are not God? But here's the thing. God cannot turn off his omniscience, right? He can't turn his omniscience off. He can't just, you know, say, well, I hope it goes this way. I hope Adam and Eve don't fall. I hope Satan doesn't fall. I hope this goes my way, but, it, you know. He knew what was going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen. And yet he created us anyway. He created the angels. He created human beings. Why? <laughs> Knowing what was going to happen, why did he do it? Why did he go through with the creation? And folks, the answer is that God is who he is. He is a creator God. He is a loving God. A life-giving God. And so when we have life, and folks... You know, listen, sometimes, you know, things go really rough. They go really rough in life, and, and we have a bad time of it. Uh, but there's also times that, you know, life is such a gift. I mean, it's it just that you feel that. You know it. That it's, it's just inherent. And so that life is a gift. And when we can enjoy that to the full, 
in eternity after we're saved. That's worth it to God. And that's why it's worth the possibility of evil, the possibility of losing some. Because we're still responsible. We're still responsible for the decisions and the actions that we take. Sin has entered the world. Our conscience is marred. But it's not obliterated. It's not obliterated. The light that God gives us, we have a responsibility to respond to that. Whosoever, whosoever will receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior will be saved. Will have eternal life. The crying and the pain and the disease and all those things are gone forever. But we got to get through this part. God could have said, no, I'm not going to create. But the gift of life that he gives is meaningful to him. When we experience it to the full, it's a wonderful gift for us. But it would mean nothing if God created us as automatons. If he created us as just wind-up dolls that we had no choice in the matter, we just did how we were programmed, do you think that would mean anything to God? Do you think that relationship would mean anything to him? The answer is no. And so, the absolute meaning that comes out of this life, this ability to choose, is profound. It's profound. And I've used examples before, you know, like especially when the kids were, were younger, uh, you know, that I'd look at just about anybody in this room, anybody, and say, you know, I'm going to leave my children with you to take care of them. That's a trust. That's a trust. And that trust is born out of something real. And that reality is that spark of life that God has given us. That he has created us in his image to be able to think, to be able to act. Now God has an advantage over us, right? So he can't sin. So, so God has a decided advantage over us in that he cannot sin. He is perfect just in pure existence. But again... The reality of our volition is what makes this all worthwhile. Even the pain. Even the pain. Um, and there is a remedy for sin. There is a fix. There is hope. And it's grounded in God's love, in his character, in, in his divinity. And that fact is, folks, is that for those who trust in Jesus Christ, we're going to heaven. We can have that knowledge. We can have that Assurance, not in a false way, but in a real way. Okay. Thank you. Amen indeed. All right, so with that said, we're going to go to where it all began here, really. Uh, as far as in terms of human perspective, let's go to Genesis 3.15. Well, we'll go a little bit before that. Um, remember Adam and Eve, they ate of the... The fruit of the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And immediately they recognized that they were naked. The innocence was gone. They had sinned. And all of a sudden, in an instant, in the blink of an eye, boom, it just all changed. It just all changed. And they were ashamed. And God said to them, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. You know, here is... Here is the key. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So it's all right there in Genesis 3.15. You've got the problem of sin. Sin has entered the world. So God promises a fix right there by promising someone will come. The seed of the woman. The seed doesn't come from the woman. The seed comes from the man. So what's the seed of the woman? It's a hint of something divine. 
a virgin birth. More on that later. And God says that he's going to strike this person I bring, this being I bring in is going to strike him on the heel. But in the Hebrew language, you shall bruise his head. It's, it's a death blow. It is a fatal strike that will destroy the evil reign that Satan has. Now we know that he doesn't, won't, won't cease to exist. He's going to be in eternal damnation. But this is where it starts. This is where Christmas starts in Genesis 3.15. Because God makes this promise that the thing that ruined everything, <laughs> the thing that brought this death and decay and disease and worry and all this stuff was born out of sin. And God says, I have a fix for this. And here is the initial, here is the start of it. Here's what I'm telling you to start things off. The seed of the woman. Someone is going to come and fix this. Okay? And this is why the, you know, they, they call it the proto-evangelicum, meaning it's the first gospel. Because it is. It's the promise of something great to come. Someone, someone divine, of, of divine origin, coming in to save and restore that which was lost. So, we have the, birth, the promise of the Savior, the virgin birth, and the outcome. And the outcome. All neatly tucked in three or four sentences. And then God builds on that along the way. He builds on that along the way. If you jump ahead to uh, Genesis 22, 18. In your offspring... He's talking to Abraham now. This is Abraham's the first Jew. This is where God is making the nation of Israel. He's creating a special nation to fulfill the promise that he made in Genesis 3.15 before there was an Israel. So God is going to create a people. He's going to create a nation that this seed of the woman, this virgin birth of this divine person is going to come through. And Abraham is the first in that line. In your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Paul follows up in Galatians 3.16. He says, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. And so there's 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. 300 prophecies about him. So I'm just focusing on the, the Christmas ones, right? I'm just focusing on those for now. But you see what God is doing. He announces the fix. He announces who's going to fix it. He announces the outcome. And then he says, okay, that's way in the future. Okay, that's going to happen. Now I'm going to start giving you details as to who this person is going to be so that when he does come, you will know it. There won't be any guessing. There won't be any... Uh, you know, uh, gosh, did, you know, how do we know? You're going to know because God is going to earmark it. He's going to provide so many details that there'll be no doubt this is who the Savior is. This is who that person that I promised in Genesis 3.15 is going to be. And so, you know, we start with, uh, with Micah 5.2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Now some people could say, well, maybe he was talking about David. He's not talking about Jesus. Well, a couple of things. This was written 300 years after David, number one. But number two, look at the next verse. Whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. You see, folks, these are not only prophecies about the Messiah, but these are statements of the Trinity. These are statements of God's divine character, the Godhead. And I, and I know I've repeated this often, but, you know, when, when Jews who are believers in Christ, when they present the gospel to, to other Jews, they, they go to the Old Testament, but whenever they talk about the Trinity, they don't start in the New Testament, they go back to the Old. Because that's where so much of the information about the Trinity is, is in the Old Testament. So God is prophesying, but to you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, one's going to come forth from me, meaning God, to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. That's a term of deity. David didn't come from everlasting. David hasn't existed eternally. He's talking about Christ. 
Was that fulfilled? Was Jesus born in Bethlehem or not? Yeah, he was. And then Isaiah 7, 14. Same thing. Uh, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the Savior is going to come, and he's his name, his title, his name is going to be God with us? Well, that sounds like a term of deity as well, right? So here again, you have a prophecy about the Messiah, but it, it also indicates, you know, it's, it's a hint at the Trinity. It's a hint at, you know, the, the deity of this uh, coming Messiah. And then in Matthew one twenty three, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. Now, one of the things that I always think about with that verse is for unto us a child is born. Okay, a lot of children are born. Um, even, you know, people, in this case, what a special birth. Unto us a child is born, but then that next line, unto us a son is given. Who gives their son? Anybody here ever give their son to anything? No. Who gives a son? God the Father gave his son. The Bible is an amazing mosaic of perfection and design. And again, the the, the plain text is the most important thing. But God has lavished his fingerprints all over this book so that we know that it is truly from him. And these are just scintillas of examples of of that. There's a lot more we could get into. Um, In Luke 131, we also see the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 6. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Uh, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now what's important is That part was fulfilled. The rest of that verse is, And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen, indeed. But once again, what do we have? We have a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, and we also see that it is couched in terms of deity. The Messiah is God. And this is not something that is you know, like a a New Testament creation that is divorced from the Old Testament. It's all interlocking. It's all a perfect fit. Um, I I, got to do this because I I just love talking. I talked about it not that long ago, but I'm going to mention it again anyway. So forgive me for the repetition. But is the government on the shoulder of Jesus Christ right now? No. No, it's not. I mean, you know, he... God allows what he allows, so it's ultimately sitting with him anyway. But when you talk about the government being on his shoulder, we think of the millennium. We think of Christ returning, sitting on David's throne and ruling the world from, you know, Jerusalem. And and in that sense, the whole world government is on the shoulders of Christ when he rules and reigns here. So that part hasn't happened yet. And you've got several instances of this in the Old Testament where you have the verse spelled out where part of it is fulfilled at the first coming, but then you read the second half and you go, well, wait a second. Um, That part hasn't been fulfilled yet. Why? Uh, That's because that's yet future. That's still coming. That's going to happen when Jesus returns. And who clears up the the questions on that? Jesus himself does. If you go down to Luke 4.18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus rolls up the scroll and he puts it back. But he stopped at a comma because what follows in Isaiah 61 and the day of vengeance of our God, which is the tribulation, which is God's judgment. So Jesus stops right in the middle of the sentence that he's quoting from Isaiah. 
He reads it and he stops. He rolls up the scroll. He says, today this has been fulfilled. Well, what about the rest of it? Well, the rest of it hasn't happened yet. That's still yet future. And so you see that quite a few times in the Old Testament where the first part's been fulfilled, the second part hasn't. And that's because you have this gap of time that takes place, the church age, and then those, the rest of that is fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. And um, so it's always important to kind of keep that in mind. And I don't want to get too derailed here, but one of the, the prophecies about Jesus when he, when he comes is that Elijah would precede his coming. And John the Baptist was a lot like Elijah. And in John's gospel, I don't remember the chapter, but Jesus looks right at John the Baptist and he says, you could be Elijah. And so in other words, what Jesus is getting at is that, look, we, the Holy Spirit has fashioned scripture to tell you what's going to happen because we know in advance, because God knows in advance what's going to take place. He knows everything that everybody's going to do with the free choices that they have. However, what, what Jesus was basically getting at is, look, if I looked over the course of time and the Jews actually did receive me as the Savior, all these other things would have been sped up and they would have been fulfilled. And you would have been Elijah. But it wasn't to happen because the Jews would not receive him. And so a lot of times these things are written in the Bible so that we know what we missed out on. So that we can look back and say, this is what was put in front of people and this is what they chose to do. And we can look at ourselves the same way. You know, I know that, you know, for a long time, you know, Christy and I got married at a Christian church at Moraine Valley. Uh, you know, I was a believer and yet, uh, you know, I kind of want my own way after that. I mean, I... I I dabbled in, you know, Bible study occasionally and, um, you know, always said I was a believer and I said my prayers dutifully and uh, started off every morning, oh Lord, give me strength. Lord, forgive me. And then boom. Okay, I got that done. Now let's go, let's go live. Let's just go do what I'm going to do. So I didn't follow it. I didn't, you know, it wasn't, it was, I wasn't committed. Uh... And that's a choice. That's a choice that's set before us. You know the right path. But what are you going to do with it is the key. And we see so often that people, nations, have made terrible choices. Angels have made terrible choices. God always has the remedy. Now again, for the angels, their fate is sealed. There's no going back one way or the other. But for all of us as human beings, even direct creations of God like Adam and Eve. God allowed us the space of repentance, of coming to know the Lord and being saved and not succumbing to the sin that we have committed, not having it be an indelible mark on us for the rest of our lives and for all of eternity, that we stepped wrong, that we sinned and it's all over. God didn't put us in that predicament. Amen. He says, I love you, I know you messed up, and you messed up badly, but I'm going to rescue you from this. All I want you to do is believe me. All I want you to do is trust me. Trust my son. Trust what I've done for you. That's it. And then your life will be changed. And then once you're in Christ, yeah, then we should, we should act and live our lives in accordance with that salvation. Um... And so, these are some of the, of the Christmas verses. I mean, there's, there's obviously a lot more. And we'll, we'll get into some more things uh, over the next couple of weeks that are really kind of fun and, and, uh, and interesting to talk about. But, um, so we think about the baby in the manger and we think about the Christmas and everything. It, it really, it, it kind of starts off with a, with a real negative. Of why Christmas is, why we have it. It's because of, because of sin. And, uh, and John MacArthur, in his book, he, he, he had a book called um, God's Gift of Christmas. And he writes, Those soft little hands, fashioned by the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb, were made so that nails might be driven through them. Those baby feet, pink and unable to walk, 
would one day walk up a dusty hill to be nailed to a cross. Jesus was born to die. And yes, he was. And the, the gentleman that wrote this article in Answers in Genesis says, yes, Jesus was born to die for sin, but also to rise in victory. Amen. Amen. And that's what we have. Uh, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5.12. So we have that. I mean, Chuck Missler, I mean, he used, to, he used to say about Jesus, he said he was crucified on a cross of wood, and yet he made the hill on which it stood. Uh, and that we are the recipients of a love story, a love story written in blood on a wooden cross, erected in Judea 2,000 years ago. So that's what Christmas is all about. So, you know, but when we sit back and, and we... You know, again, I love the lights. I, I love the time of year. I love the carols. Uh, I love the tree. I love the just the thought of, you know, the birth of the baby Jesus. It's it's a wonderful thing. But you got to take it really full circle. I mean, even uh, even the song that Christopher played uh, in in during the offering, uh, I, I got good memories of a kid. Even the, the album, the thirty three, the thirty three record. You know, that, that, that I used to play that song all the time on this big stereo, this big gigantic stereo. And uh, it had the, in the middle, it had the, the, the label, it had like, it was light blue with clouds and a couple of angels, you know, uh, poking out through the clouds and stuff like that. So there's a lot of good memories of Christmas. And there's a lot of tradition and all that is great stuff. Um... But when you think about the sin, you think about why Jesus was born and what he would go through, it really <laughs> causes us to really think a lot more and really kind of dig deep down and realize, wow, are we loved. Wow, are we loved. But I guess just for the, you know, for the purposes of, of Christmas, I, I guess when you, when you think about it, uh, everything goes on in the world, all the pain, the evil, um, the sadness. Just imagine in your mind's eye that, that night that the Savior is born. That he comes into this dark world with this radiant light and the host, heavenly host, and uh, you know, praising God, saying glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What a sight that must have been. And what a thought that is. What a, uh, a great thing to think about. That this is the beginning. The birth of Christ is the beginning of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. You had all the, the notes about who he would be. How things would happen. When he would come in to the world. And then he does. And that starts this wonderful thing. And so that's why I think we, we love Christmas so much. Because it is the start of what would be our rescue from the dominion of darkness. And from uh, the pain and torture of hell into God's glorious kingdom through his dear son. Amen? Amen. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us. And Lord, sometimes that just, again, doesn't seem enough uh, to say thank you. But Lord, so let us live our lives in gratitude and uh, Father, everything we do, just let it run through the filter of Christ, the filter of the Bible, and know that, uh, Lord, you have set all things, and you have brought us into your family, and we have a wonderful future. And let us love one another, Lord, pray for one another, give you worship and praise, and always be ready to give a defense for what we believe, to, to share the truth. Give us the timing and the words, Lord, and bless our lives, Father, ourselves here, our families, our friends. Father, let us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.